Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff. On the News Hour tonight, negotiations over the trade war with China end without a deal as the U.S. imposes higher tariffs on more than $200 billion worth of Chinese goods. Then we are on the ground in Iowa as 2020 Democratic presidential hopefuls make their pitches to the nation's first caucus goers. And it's Friday. Mark Shields and David Brooks are here to discuss Congress's vote to hold the U.S. Attorney General in contempt, the fight over subpoenaing Donald Trump Jr., and the ongoing trade war with China. Plus, Masterworks by Rembrandt, a major museum in Amsterdam, displays its entire collection of the Dutch painter's work. We still have emotions in the 21st century. It, it's what defines us basically as human beings. So when we look at Rembrandt's paintings, we actually experience our own humanity. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. The U.S.-China trade talks have ended for now. The new tariffs have just begun. President Trump imposed the higher 25 percent levies overnight in a bid to bring Beijing to an agreement. And he promised they will help, not hurt, the U.S. But the latest negotiations ended without resolving the standoff. And U.S. farmers in particular are bracing for further pain. We'll have an extended report after the news summary. Wall Street managed a modest rally despite the ongoing China tensions. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 114 points to close at 25,942. The Nasdaq rose six, and the S&P 500 added 10. A top House Democrat has issued a new subpoena today for six years of President Trump's tax returns. Congressman Richard Neal chairs the House Ways and Means Committee. He had already made a formal request for the returns, but the Treasury Department rejected it this week. This comes on the day the chair of the U.S. House Judiciary Committee says he is open to further talks on obtaining the full Mueller report. The chairman, Democrat Jerry Nadler, sent a letter today to Attorney General William Barr. The committee voted this week to hold Barr in contempt for not releasing the full report. Also today, Nadler announced that special counsel Robert Mueller will not testify before Congress next week, but that talks continue on another date. The U.S. and Iran kept up a war of words today. Tensions escalated this week over U.S. claims of unspecified threats by Tehran. Today, the U.S. military confirmed that B-52 bombers have arrived in Qatar. And the aircraft carrier Abraham Lincoln is nearing the Persian Gulf. The Pentagon also announced that it will send a Patriot missile battery to the region. Acting Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan warned Iran to tread carefully. It's important that Iran understand that an attack on Americans or its interests will be met with an appropriate response. We will position ourselves, we will protect our interests, but we're there to build security. Earlier, a top commander in Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guard rejected any talks with the U.S. President Trump had said that he would like for Iranian leaders to call him. The U.S. House of Representatives approved a disaster relief bill today with $19 billion for flood victims, for farmers and hurricane survivors. More than 30 Republicans joined Democrats to pass it over the president's objections. He had opposed additional funding in the bill for Puerto Rico's hurricane recovery. Negotiations remain before the issue is resolved. Forecasters are warning of severe storms and possible flash floods across the south this weekend. The weather system already dumped downpours from Missouri to Louisiana. In Houston, cars struggle to push through high waters early this morning. And rivers remain swollen into the afternoon. In the Mediterranean, U.N. migration officials say as many as 70 people drowned when their boat capsized today. The vessel had sailed from Libya for Europe when it sent a distress signal off the city of Safax in Tunisia. It was the deadliest such incident since January. 
Facebook's founder, Mark Zuckerberg, met with French President Emmanuel Macron today under growing pressure over online hate speech. The meeting in Paris came as French regulators issued a new report. They urged fines for social networks that do not remove hateful content. Back in this country, Washington state has ended the right for parents to exempt their children from taking the measles vaccine for personal and philosophical grounds. A law signed today still allows exemptions for medical or religious reasons. More than 760 cases of measles are confirmed nationwide this year, including more than 70 in Washington state. And today marked 150 years since the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. A final golden spike was hammered into place in Utah on May 10, 1869. Today, thousands of visitors celebrated with a reenactment. The Transcontinental Line cut cross-country travel time from six months to roughly 10 days. Still to come on the news hour, the Trump administration places higher tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods. On the ground in Iowa is Democratic presidential hopefuls campaign across the state. Mark Shields and David Brooks break down a busy week in Washington, the risk that illegal tiger trafficking posed to the endangered species, and much more. The U.S.-China trade war intensified today as the Trump administration increased tariffs on imported goods from China, and China pledged to retaliate. As Nick Schifrin reports, China's top negotiator left Washington without an agreement. On a sunny Friday morning in Washington, the trade war escalated with a handshake. The top Chinese and U.S. negotiators ended their 11th round of talks cordially, but the two countries are in economic conflict. Today, the U.S. increased tariffs from 10 to 25 percent on $200 billion of Chinese exports, including seafood, luggage, purses, and parts sold to U.S. companies such as circuit boards, microprocessors, and machinery. And the U.S. is threatening to go even further and impose tariffs on all cell phones, clothing, and laptops made in China and exported to the U.S. In response, the Chinese foreign ministry vowed, quote, necessary countermeasures, and spokesman Zheng Shuang asked the U.S. to give a little. The two sides need to meet each other halfway. But the U.S. accuses China of not going halfway. U.S. officials say over all these rounds of negotiations, they hammered out a 150-page deal with changes to Chinese laws that would open the Chinese market to U.S. companies and protect U.S. technology and intellectual property. But last weekend, the U.S. believes Xi Jinping rejected those changes to laws. We were getting very close to a deal. Then they started to renegotiate the deal. We can't have that. We can't have that. So our country can take in $120 billion a year in tariffs, paid for mostly by China, by the way, not by us. A lot of people try and steer it in a different direction. It's really paid, ultimately, it's paid for by, largely by China. Tariffs are taxes that American pay, Americans pay. They're taxes that American companies pay. Ultimately, they're taxes that consumers pay. And they're taxes that result in job losses in the United States. Steve Lamar is the executive vice president of the American Apparel and Footwear Association. He opposes this round of tariffs and says if further tariffs are imposed on everything made and shipped out of China, the victims will be American consumers. If you realize that 82% of our Backpacks and purses and travel goods come from China. 70% uh, of our footwear comes from China. 42% of our apparel comes from China. When you tax these items, that's going to result in about a $500 increase uh, for an average family of four. And some of the families worst hit by the trade war are farmers. The Richard family has been farming for around 100 years. Uh, my grandfather, great-grandfather, and myself and hopefully the next generation. Daniel Richard farms soybeans, rice, and crawfish in Louisiana. He and his fellow farmers were hit by Chinese retaliatory tariffs, making it impossible to sell their crop. They had to leave them in the field to die. And today, soybean prices are so low, he can't cover his costs. He spoke to us from his phone on his farm. At the selling price it is now, um, at $8 beans, we can't pay the expenses that we're putting out in the field. So it, we're unprofitable as soon as we put the planter in the field. 
He doesn't blame President Trump. He blames the Chinese and urges both sides to make a deal to save American family farms. He fears his son won't be able to follow in his footsteps. Well, he just graduated from college. I can see in his heart and his blood he's got it in him. And he's, he's definitely got the work ethic. But he sees what's going on right now. And there's other opportunities out there. It's not just the farms that are hurting. It's these little communities that are hurting. Administration officials say they understand that short-term pain and ask for patience as they try to change long-term Chinese economic behavior. But for now, as it was in Washington this afternoon, there could be stormy days ahead. This afternoon, though, President Trump tweeted and called today's discussions candid and constructive and said the conversations will continue. To talk this through, we get two differing views. Ryan Haas was the director for China on the National Security Council staff during the Obama administration. He is now a Brookings Institution fellow. And Derek Scissors has written extensively about China's economy and is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you very much to you both for joining the news hour. Ryan Haas, let me start with you. Many assumed last week that there would be a deal between the two sides. Uh, was this a breakdown we saw today? Well, it appears to have been a breakdown from expectations. Uh, as you said, a week ago, it looked promising that there would be a deal. And then over the weekend, President Trump and members of his team indicated that the Chinese had backed away from commitments that they thought they had already uh, received from them. And as a consequence, we now have uh, another step on the escalatory ladder of tariffs with China. So my concern is that we've taken another step down a dark tunnel with no end in sight. Derek Scissors, is this a step down a dark tunnel with no end in sight? Uh, if you wanted the deal that was on the table, it is. I was not at all convinced the deal on the table was going to work. In particular, I thought China's incentives to keep its promises on intellectual property were, you know, were low. And then the Chinese backed that up by saying, we don't want to make the legal changes uh, that even might lead us to keeping our word on intellectual property. So uh, it's certainly a step away from the deal. I don't think that's necessarily a step down a dark tunnel. Meaning you don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to step away from that deal? That's right. Um, it's going to be very difficult to get China to change its policies on intellectual property, as well as others such as subsidies to state-owned enterprises. It shouldn't be an easy deal. It certainly shouldn't be a deal that the president makes in a phone call with Xi Jinping. As some have implied, we're going to have difficulties in the negotiation. This is all part of the pro what the process should look like. So, um, Ryan Haas, intellectual property, uh, as Derek Scissors just mentioned, uh, subsidies for state-owned enterprises, forced technology transfer, these are the things that the U.S. is trying to get China to change. Can tariffs achieve that? Well, thus far, I think that we've overestimated our ability to muscle the Chinese into accepting our will and underestimated China's ability to punch us in places that hurt. And as a result, American people are feeling the pain. And so if the question is, are we going to get absolute surrender from the Chinese? I'm very pessimistic that that's the case. Uh, if we can make progress where progress is possible, I think we should do so. Derek Scissors, is that, is that enough, uh, a progress, uh, as Ryan Haas put it, uh, rather than get the Chinese to surrender? Well, first of all, I, I disagree with both premises and Ryan's point. When he says the American people are feeling the pain, farmers are feeling the pain. Aggregate U.S. economic growth is strong. Consumer prices are low. I don't, I don't see much pain caused by China tariffs. They may be caused by bad fiscal policy, but not by our China policy. And then the second part, of course, it's a false dichotomy to say the idea is we have to accept a Chinese offer or they have to surrender. Um, as I said, this is going to be a long, difficult process. We're not going to get everything we want. But the, the, you know, to make a deal just so that you can remove uncertainty for the stock market or the like would be a mistake that would hurt the U.S. for years to come. Ryan Haas, short-term pain, uh, okay for long-term gain? What do you think? Well, if there is long-term gain that accompanies the short-term pain, then sure. But right now, all we're seeing is the pain without any accompanying gain. I think the American people were supportive of President Trump shaking things up and trying a new approach to China. I think that uh, there was merit in it. Uh, but they wanted to achieve a purpose, not attack China on principle. And uh, right now, we are in this escalatory spiral where neither side appears willing to take a step back from the brink. And I don't think that's a good place for the United States to be. Derek, so let, me, let me ask about uh, leverage right now. Um, who has more leverage, the United States or, or China? And, and do both leaders believe right now that they can actually push the other around? Uh, I hope not, because that's, that's pushing the other around, as, as Ryan just mentioned, for no goal is not a, a, a good strategy to get what you want. Uh, I do think the U.S. has more leverage. The president is right about that. 
uh, but the leverage has to be applied over an extended period of time. If the president becomes impatient, as it seems he was uh, late last year and early this year, then we can't use that leverage. Um, the, the U.S. leverage advantage is a long-term leverage advantage. It's not about you know, signing on tariffs and then saying a week later, are you ready to make a deal? We're going to have to have some pain to get China to change its policies. If we're not willing to put up with that pain, then we should just abandon this process and sign a, you know, a short-term deal that does very little. Ryan Haas? Yeah, sorry. I think Derek makes a great point. Uh, in trade negotiations, the patient party has an advantage. The disciplined party has an advantage. And uh, right now, the Chinese are trying to stake out that territory. The Chinese have a view that they have leverage because the closer that we get to our 2020 presidential election, the more desirous President Trump will be of a deal. Uh, the United States believes that it has leverage because our economy is strong. And, um, and China, we believe, the Trump administration believes that China's economy is brittle and that President Xi needs a deal. And so we find ourselves stuck in this dilemma where both sides think they have leverage over the other and neither appears willing to make the compromises necessary to reach a deal. Derek Sizzler, should the U.S. be making compromises right now? No, it should not. Um, again, uh, if you start with the, the premise that we have serious problems in our relationship with China, you don't try to get to a quick outcome. You, you, you have to deal with uncertainty and risk and stock market losses and all the things that come in with long negotiations. We should not be in a hurry to make a deal. Now, Ryan may be right that the president sees uh, the need to make a deal before the 2020 election. I hope that's not true. Uh, I hope he continues to receive support as he has from both parties because both parties have realized we need a change in the China relationship and it's not going to be easy. Ryan Haas, you mentioned whether uh, the, the perspective from the Chinese that the U.S. Uh, actually has less leverage. There's a notion of the Chinese officials I talk to who say basically, you guys can't take the heat. You guys can't take the political heat or the president can't take the political heat uh, and actually uh, make sacrifices. Yeah. Uh, is that right? Well, Nick, I think you're right. I think there's a baked in assumption that the Chinese have that the American political system is ill-equipped for pain tolerance. And the Chinese see that as their advantage. They see their system, their top-down Leninist system, where they have a leader that doesn't face re-election, a leader that does have control over his media and can tamp down discontent or protest, and a leader that can allocate resources where they're needed with control of fiscal and monetary levers as distinct advantages that they have on a systemic level uh, relative to the United States. I agree with Derek. I would like for us to prove them wrong as an American, but uh, we will see. Derek Scissors, last word to you. Uh, do you have faith that uh, the administration is going to pursue this path uh, in the correct way, in your opinion? No, I'm afraid not. I, I think the president's constant comments about his friendship with Xi Jinping make it difficult to have faith. I think he deserves great credit for identifying this problem and being more aggressive than President Obama and President Bush. We need that. But I think the president is still looking for maybe a personal connection to Xi to seal a deal that will benefit the United States for a year or two, but not solve the problems we have with China. Derek Scissors with the American Enterprise Institute. Ryan Haas, former Obama National Security Council China director now at Brookings. Thanks to you both. Thank you. There are still nine months before the first votes of the 2020 presidential election, but the battle to win the Iowa caucuses is well underway. Just in the past week, eight Democratic hopefuls have campaigned across the state. Amna Nawaz talked to some voters in the Hawkeye state to find out how they are sorting out whom to support. It's after seven on a Tuesday night. Oh, there's Andrea. Which means book club night for Ruth and Scott Thompson. Did you sign in? Okay, perfect. But in Des Moines, Iowa, in the run-up to a heated presidential contest, even book clubs can become political. Do you ever not talk about politics at home? <laughs> <laughs> we talk about what channel we're going to watch politics on. No, we actually... Baseball once in a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this particular group, with more than 700 members, is making its way through every candidate biography published so far. How would you help a state like that to... Then inviting them to take questions. Tonight... I understand the anxiety that people feel. It's former Housing and Urban Development Secretary Julian Castro's turn. So already, Secretary Castro has spent 14 days of his campaign here in Iowa. In fact, every single Democratic presidential candidate has made a trip to the state at least once in the election cycle. 
In a crowded Democratic field of more than 20, candidates are hoping that intimate moments like this... Hello, how are you? Sign my book. Sure, sure. Moments that come early in the cycle could lead to support in the all-important Iowa caucuses in February, the first in the country. A lot of people don't know anything about me, and so uh, it's a great opportunity every time I get in front of an audience here in Iowa or one of the other states to let them know where I'm coming from and what I want to do for them and for their family. That is why I'm here. That is why I'm running to serve you as an... The night before, the Thompsons went to see former Congressman Beto O'Rourke on his third trip to Iowa. Ultimately, it's going to be up to the voters in Iowa, those who will go to the caucuses to, to determine who the nominee will be, or at least who's going to have a head start uh, against the rest of the field coming out of Iowa. We've held now more than 120 town hall meetings over the last six weeks across 14 states, most of them here in, in Iowa. Just name a candidate, and they're already here in some form. My name is Deepak. I'm an organizer with the Cory Booker campaign. How are you doing today? Senator Booker's team is settling in to their state headquarters. Can we count on you to attend? Hosting a slate of events to start getting caucus goers to commit. I know there are a lot of candidates in this race. John Delaney is a congressman from Maryland. Ten minutes down the road, Congressman Delaney's office, one of eight in the state, is humming with activity, drumming up support. Have you given any thought to who you might be supporting in, in the caucuses next year just yet? Being a winner is always important, and being the winner of the first contest is always important um, in the presidential sweepstakes. Kay Henderson, news director for Radio Iowa, has covered presidential elections for 30 years. She's seen dozens of candidates come through her home state courting votes. The last four nominees for the Democratic Party have won the Iowa caucuses, so it's an important contest from that perspective. It also gives the candidates a chance to travel to state and test out their message. Large try, anything else? One Iowa pit stop for candidates to test those messages is Smoky Row Coffee House, already this year. Castro, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and entrepreneur Andrew Yang have passed through, among others. No candidates here today, but local businessmen T.J. Johnsrud and Jim Townsend are happy to break down the field over breakfast. One's independent, the other's Republican, but both say they're open to registering and caucusing as Democrats this year. We're the first in the country, so uh, this is where they get known. This is a good place for them to start, actually, and they get vetted pretty quickly, you know. So has anyone stuck out to you so far? Well, I think O'Rourke is an interesting guy. Beto, I like, he's got an interesting name anyway. And uh, Joe Biden, of course, is a known commodity, and Bernie Sanders. What is it you're looking for in a candidate? Oh, boy. Civility, maybe. Acting like a president. A few tables away, Elaine M. Lau and Ann Rezark say they've been tracking the field. I've seen Kamala Harris and Cory Booker and uh, Bernie Sanders and Andrew Yang. Both are registered Democrats. It's worth noting in a state that Donald Trump won by 10 points in 2016. But they say they're waiting to pick until the pack thins out, paying close attention to one thing. Who's civil? That's a big thing for you? That's a big thing for me after everything that's been going on. What about you? Does that matter to you as well? I want somebody who can win. And normally that wouldn't be my prime. I usually go with who I feel would be the best and I'm having a lot of internal conflict about who do I think would be the best, who do I think could actually win, and that might not be the same person. Kay Henderson says Iowans are approaching this crowded field with open minds. That was certainly not the case in 2015 at this point, because you had people who were Clinton supporters, and you had people that were Sanders supporters, and never the twain did meet. <laughs> But this time around, I go to candidate events in a certain community, and the same people are turning out to see multiple candidates. This is so hard. I've never struggled with choosing a candidate the way that I have this year. The Thompsons are far from deciding, but a few candidates top their lists right now. So Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, Beto, and Julian, and Pete. So yeah, uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar. First and foremost, having live through 2016, my first question is, can they win? Is that one of the most important things to both of you now, is can this person win? Can this person beat President Trump? 
yeah, we're not so idealistic that we that that it's our principle is we need to win. There's a world in which you guys could disagree on which candidate you support. Yeah. <laughs> and you're both Actually, very politically active. But we've taken the pledge that if we end up in different campaigns, we won't share strategies or give away campaign secrets. No. You'll build a wall between we, the two yes. of you. Yes, yeah. there will be a firewall. Yep. yep, absolutely. Can you do that? Yep. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, we yeah. do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they'll have plenty of chances to meet the candidates again and again as campaigns continue to build up their staff on the ground and the candidates descend for this summer's Iowa State Fair. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Amna Navaz in Des Moines, Iowa. And now to the analysis of Shields and Brooks. That is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Hello to both of you. So before we turn to all the whatever we want to call it that's happened in Washington this week, Mark, let's talk a minute about Iowa. We heard this voter tell Amna, uh, this is really hard. I don't know why it's so hard. There are only 23 candidates. No, that's right. <laughs> it, that, that, that is, Amna captured the Iowa essence. I mean, these people take their responsibility very seriously. They do. It's not casual. They are gatekeepers. Between Iowa and New Hampshire, they are 1.4% of the population of the country. And unless you finish in the top three in Iowa and the top two in New Hampshire, you will not be elected president of the United States based on historical precedent. And that's why it makes sense for both Mr. Castro and, and Mr. O'Rourke to be spending time there. They get one-on-one -on -one time. Yeah, if you love politics, this is the time to go, actually, right now, because yeah. there's, like, crowds of three or, mm -hmm. or eight, and there are candidates everywhere. You can drive to in beautiful weather and see beautiful candidates, and then the, it all peaks at the state fair where all, they all sort of congregate. My most uh, profound political coverage moment was covering Gary Bauer, who was running in the Republican primary, as he toured a refrigerated railway car with the Last Supper carved in butter in Life Size. <laughs> And yeah. that was politics at its That's, best. Yeah. That was a state fair. That was that a is, state fair. Which is coming up in August. We've already got it on our calendar here, Raise, here at the News Hour. Raise the, the cholesterol calendar. level of the entire <laughs> state and press corps. All right, so now uh, tear ourselves away from Iowa, Mark, to talk about what's going on in Washington this week, this escalating battle between the Congress and the White House. Uh, just today, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in the House, Richard Neal, is, is uh, subpoenaing the Secretary of the Treasury, the head of the IRS, to go after the president's tax, tax return. This on top of subpoenas for the president's son, subpoenas for the attorney general. Uh, what do we make of all this? Well, I mean, we, I think it's approaching almost uh, situational overload in, in terms of, I mean, we're talking about subpoenas from uh, committees, uh, including the House Intelligence Committee, uh, the, the House Banking Committee, uh, the Judiciary Committee, the, uh, across the board. Uh, and, and now we have the Intelligence Committee in the Senate, as you mentioned, uh, led by uh, Republicans uh, that have subpoenaed the pr president's son. Uh, I, I just think, Judy, that uh, in a strange way, this plays to Donald Trump's strength. I mean, Donald Trump lives in chaos. I think it's a, sort of almost a, an emotional and technological and intellectual overload, uh, given the fact that we're on the cusp of war in, the, in the Iran, uh, in, in Venezuela, uh, in a showdown with the Chinese. Um, I mean, it's just, but this, this is what he thrives on, and I think there's a, almost a, I dare you to impeach me. Uh, attitude that's oh, overload you mean for the American people for the American people and and for the and for the this isn't the system wasn't intended for this I mean this isn't the way it's constructed that we we can deal with crisis upon crisis upon crisis David Some the Democrats say they're very serious about all this they want this information they want this testimony I mean, are they pursuing the right strategy for them? Uh, no, well, neither side is. You know, it's the complete breakdown of the checks and balances system. The, the president has to say, Congress, I need you. I need you to oversee what I'm doing. I need you to correct my imbalances. And so I'm going to cooperate with you. And that's just the normal way we do business. Mm -hmm. And the Trump administration is not doing that. So that's the first crisis. The second is, if you're going to do oversight, you've got to oversee. You've got to try to say, I'm at least going to try to be a productive force here. But what we're seeing on the side of the Democrats is an escalation of the passion, and it's just become an attack machine. Uh, and so there's just a lot of there's a lot of talk now about jailing people. There's a lot of talk about 
just holding multiple people in contempt. This fight over the redaction is a, a, the wrong fight to have. Of the Mueller report. Of the Mueller report. The, 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 the administration has offered to show the, of the volume two, which is about obstruction, the vast majority, 99.5% to at least the elite Democrats. And that wasn't good enough, and so there was a little of a negotiation which broke down. Uh, but to me, that issuing orders of contempt, which may go forward, just freezes everything. It just pushes everything into the courts, and we sit there and do nothing for a couple of years. And so there's a way to do this, and there's a way not to do this. So there's a lot of error on the Trump administration. But nonetheless, I think the Democrats across the board and across many committees are sort of walking slowly up toward impeachment. And we could end up in impeachment, and I, I do think that's what Donald Trump But, Mark, I, like we had on the program uh, last night Jerry Nadler, who's mm -hmm. the chairman of the House Judiciary yes. Committee, who's, who essentially said, if we don't carry out our responsibility, we, we're, we're not fulfilling what the Constitution, what the founders wanted and expected Congress to do, which is have oversight over the, the executive. No, that, that, that is a, it's a legitimate argument. Make, make no mistake about it. I mean, that uh, if you lay down a precedent, that the, uh, literally that this precedent can, this president gets away with uh, what he's getting away with and the Congress does nothing, then that certainly lays the precedent for the, for the next president. I, I think, uh, just to add to what David, the point David made, Donald Trump, according to USA Today, which established a database, has been a plaintiff or a defendant in 4,095 lawsuits. Now, think about that. I mean, that, that's, a, that's an awful over lot. Over his career. Over his career. I mean, about employment, about uh, contracts, about subcontractors, uh, you, you name it. Uh, it, it he's been, and and he, you talk about litigious. He enjoys this. I mean, he thrives on this. This is modus operandi. And I, and I really think th 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 they're playing to his strength, quite honestly. Uh, and and, he's, and he's, he's sitting there quite... Honestly, Judy, with 91 percent approval among Republicans, but, and that that just uh, I think intimidates his own party. But David, are, are, are the are the two of you saying Democrats just drop this? I no, mean, what, no. What should they approach? No, they should they they should be in the business of trying to inform the American voter. Mm -hmm. And so, getting Mueller to testify, the fact Absolutely. that Mueller may not testify is, is outrageous. Mueller should no. testify, yep. and so they should be in that business. But basically, what they're doing is walking up toward the line of impeachment, and you can see the passions rising as they get further and further down that line. And there's a difference between going toward the prosecutorial impeachment and having hearings to educate the American voter. And w when you get down one path, you're really trying to appease the the part of the party that wants the caucus, that wants impeachment. And the problem when you try to appease that part you end up emboldening, and you, you just turn it into an attack game. And what Donald Trump wants, who would who was Donald Trump want to be his foil, his opposite member? Does he want it to be the, the presidential candidates, most of whom are kind of attractive, uh, who he's actually running against? Or would he rather run against Congress? Of course he'd rather run against Congress. Any president would. But, Mark, I mean, I just, I come back to what the Democrats are saying is we want this information. The administration right. is saying, we're not going to give it to you, so this, how do, it doesn't yeah, no, ever get resolved. You no, know, there's no question that they're playing, they're, they're playing absolutely uh, hardball and, and uh, is the administration, and they're, and they're being, they're not being respectful of the law in the least. I think, Judy, we have to make the difference is the Russians were involved in this election in 2016. Make no mistake about it. Our intelligence agencies have all concluded that unanimously. They were around in 2018. They got all the way into a county in Florida, into its official right. site. So that, that is a legitimate area. What, what are we going to have American elections for Americans and not interference? That, 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 and, and nobody can argue with that, save Donald Trump. I mean, his own administration is mindful of and that. And you're saying that's what they should be talking that, about. I think, I, than... think that's, I think that's where they ought to be going. Let's and turn. There's even a weird moment where a senator started acting like a senator, Richard Burr, the Richard Burr. Republican from North, North Carolina, Carolina. Who, who wanted to bring Don Jr. to, to investigate that exact question. The rest of the Republican Party went crazy because he was acting like an actual senator who wants to get at the bottom of a very serious issue. And, and Judy, point out that his, his own colleague, uh, in uh, Tom Tillis in North Carolina, who had written a very straightforward op-ed page piece in the, in the Washington Post opposing Donald right. Trump's de declaration of a national emergency on building the wall, and then caved like a $4 suitcase uh, when Donald Trump objected, went after, went after 
his own colleague, Richard Burr, and criticized him for leading a bipartisan investigation. I'm thinking of a $4 suitcase. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, David, I, I want to turn, though, to, to the, uh, all the, the news today about China. The president basically saying, uh, we're throwing these tariffs down, and, and this is the way it's going to be. The president's thrown the gauntlet down, knowing that the U.S. economic interests, farmers, auto manufacturers, are going to suffer. Right. And I think normally the default for a lot of people, certainly in the center right, would be this is ridiculous. The trade wars are always unwinnable. But I'm struck by the broad consensus among many people who normally are very pro free traders that something has to be done about China right now. That they are moving up the, the supply chain and up to the, our industries, AI and the high tech industries, and they're not doing it fairly, they're doing it by stealing. And so the, the, the systemic threat that China presents now makes some hard negotiation and even some tariffs acceptable. And so China has brought this on themselves and has converted a lot of people who are radically pro-free trade into thinking, we've got to do something about China. Is it something, though, Mark, that the president should be thinking about? Vote, there are voters out there who are concerned with farmers' interests and other economic, U.S. economic interests that are going to be hurt by this. Uh, sure, no, sure there are, Judy, but, but I mean, and this is a time, if ever there was one, when you want a coalition of nations. You want, you, and, and we find ourselves isolated increasingly. Um, in, under this administration and this president's approach. I mean, th this is a time for a coordinated, collective, strong uh, approach to an enforcement with China. And I, I agree with David that, that China has to be confronted. I mean, whether this is the... Donald Trump has one great asset going into 2020, and that is a booming American economy. I mean, it is, it is unparalleled. 50 years, the lowest unemployment, rising wages. But are you saying this risks... Yeah, I, think it puts risk? it, I think it definitely puts it at risk. I really do. You could have a very bad outcome, which would actually have an actual trade war. You could, it seems unlikely to me, have a good outcome where China actually does move. China seems under no pressure to actually do that. And then there's a lot of different scenarios in between. But the possibility of a real trade war is certainly a live possibility. I just wish we could have more confidence in our side of the table. Only 40 seconds left. Iran, uh, to both of you very quickly, uh, is the president wise at this point to be pushing Iran? We've got now a, a carrier moving into the region. We've got B-52s. Uh, what's, yeah. what's, what are we looking at here? To me, these are, this is a Potemkin foreign policy. It has a facade of toughness, but there's no actual interagency process behind it. There's no actual delivery mechanism. So it, to me, it looks a little more like bluster. Two battle carrier groups, Judy, one in the Med and one in the Gulf. I mean, th this, is, this is serious stuff. We're talking about uh, a president who got elected by withdrawing from American entanglements. Um, and and this, is, th this is serious stuff. Uh, and I, I just commend both Senator Tim Kaine, the Democrat from Virginia, and Todd Young, the Republican from Indiana, who are trying to get the Congress to confront the fact that they have never repealed the authorization of United military force, which is, uh, over, since World War II, 153,000 Americans have died in uniform without any declaration of war. Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you. Yeah. Earlier this week, the United Nations warned that roughly one million of the world's species are on the verge of extinction, more than at any other time in human history. As William Brangham reports, one of those threatened species is one of the most iconic animals on Earth, the tiger. That's right, Judy. It's estimated there are fewer than 4,000 tigers remaining in the wild today, down from roughly 100,000 in the early 1900s. More tigers now live in captivity than in the wild. And many of those can be found in so-called tiger farms, where they are bred, raised, and then slaughtered, sold for their skin and body parts on the black market. In a new investigative report for The Washington Post, Terence McCoy traveled to Laos in Southeast Asia and got an inside look at some of these farms and the grisly trade that keeps them afloat. And Terence joins me now. Welcome. Thanks for having me. It's really an uh, incredibly brutal and powerful piece of reporting that you've done about this market and the forces that are driving it. But 
Can you just start off by telling us what is driving this market? What do people want Tiger Parts for? I mean, that's a big question that we had when we first started off with this was, what on earth do people want tigers for? Um, one of the most iconic of species. And what we found was some of the qualities that make the tiger so iconic have also been its undoing. That because it's so strong, because it's so ferocious, it has become something of a medicine for a lot of folks uh, in China, for traditional Chinese medicine. That they think that all the elements that make the tiger what it is can also be used to treat human ailments. And the other factor of this is because it's become something of a status symbol, that, that if you are wealthy enough, you can actually wear tiger on you. It's a luxury item. So this has created a cir circumstance where people want it for both medicine and also just to show off their wealth. And just for the record, it's, there is no medicinal benefit to eating or imbibing no, anything from a tiger. There's no medicinal benefit to this whatsoever. Uh, uh, the, 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 there have been rumors that they've had medicinal elements going back 1,400 years, but clearly there's no medicinal benefit to that whatsoever. Your report is, is largely, is also a profile of this man, Carl Amman, who you basically travel with all through Southeast Asia. He is this sort of striking, quixotic uh, activist figure. Can you tell us a little bit more about him? As much as this story was a profile of the tiger trade and what's happening with the tiger is also a profile of obsession. And somebody becomes so consumed by their mission that it's, it, that it's that's all that they do. And Carl Mann has become something of a Don Cody figure in, in the conservation movement, just someone shouting into the wind. Uh, today, there are a lot of discussion about the mounting extinction rates. Carl's been talking about this for decades. And for decades, not many people have been listening to him. And now, finally, he's doing more investigations that this is something that's happening in this world and it's something that we have to take note of. You visit several of these tiger farms in the course of your reporting. Some of them are sort of small and look very ramshackle. Others are almost industrial scale in their size. I mean, you must have been shocked to see this kind of, this sort of farming of an animal like a tiger. Yeah, the most amazing thing was that you'd be driving down these roads in Laos that were rural, and also you'd come upon some gates. And beyond those gates was something of a, an industrial enterprise that they could farm hundreds of tigers in these places. And then we'd have, we'd have a drone going over it, and inside that footage, you'd see tigers as small as ants down there prowling around, and you can see just at that moment that this isn't like a, a kitty operation, this is industrial. That, that, that we are creating out of this, uh, tiger becomes a product along this assembly line. The thing that also really comes through in your reporting is this, the difficulty of trying to stamp out this trade. Because all the nations that you visit and all the big uh, Southeast Asian and Asian nations say, we want to put a stop to this trade, but it, it, it persists, as your reporting shows. Why is it so hard to stamp out? I mean, there's a difference between passing a law and actually enforcing it. And what's happening in a lot of countries where wildlife trafficking is especially rampant is they are the same places that also have endemic poverty have endemic struggles. And a lot of these countries have neither the legal framework nor sometimes even the political will to be able to take on very powerful entrenched wildlife interests in the country that, that want to traffic these animals. And also you have people who are just struggling to survive. And sometimes it's easy for you and I to say they shouldn't be doing this, but ultimately for them, it's a decision between uh, poaching an animal or trafficking an animal or not being able to possibly to feed their family. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, what we have are people making those decisions to, to work in this enterprise. Carl Amon, who you follow, has actually been tracking this one particular tiger farmer for years. And there's an incredible scene where he actually meets him Finally, after years of sort of hunting this man, can you explain, describe that scene? It kind of typifies that same idea where, where he has been, um, he's been tracking this person for, for five years and he grows into this larger than life figure in Carl's mind where uh, he's talked to him in, in intimate detail about how he goes about butchering these tigers and finally Carl meets him and what he finds is not some sort of gangster, some sort of taciturn, menacing person, but decked in jewelry. What he finds is somebody who's in dusty, dirty pants and flip-flops. Uh, it's just smoking a cigarette and drinking a beer. Um, and what he finds is not is somebody who's impoverished. Um, and what Carl realizes in that moment is this just one more bit player in a world that's unable to save itself. Really a tremendous piece of reporting. Terrence McCoy of The Washington Post, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.
2019 marks the 350th anniversary of the death of the Dutch master painter Rembrandt. To celebrate his life and legacy, museums in the Netherlands are dedicating this entire year to new exhibits showcasing his work. Jeffrey Brown traveled to Amsterdam as part of our ongoing arts and culture series, Canvas. The Night Watch by Rembrandt van Rijn. Every day, thousands of visitors crowd into Amsterdam's Rijksmuseum to catch a glimpse of one of history's most celebrated artworks, a masterpiece of storytelling, light and shadow on a mammoth scale. But we got our own after-hours look at it and the other works in the museum's extraordinary new exhibition titled All the Rembrandts. It's part of the Netherlands celebrations commemorating the 350th anniversary of his death and marks the first time this world-renowned museum has made its entire collection of Rembrandts open to the public. So this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see it all out. Yeah, Jane Turner is curator of prints. Right? And it's something you can just come back to over and over again and each time you look you'll see something new and something different. There are 22 paintings, including grand portraits of Dutch high society and scenes from the Bible, 60 drawings, and more than 300 prints. They span his career and show an artist unmatched at capturing the humanity in his subjects, even in sketches of daily life, like this one of a pancake maker and some very hungry children. She looks a bit cynical and she's thinking, yeah, you'll get your pancake when I see the money. <laughs> and the young kid, it's brilliant. He's, so, he's digging in his pocket and he's really, really digging. And, and remember, he just manages, he makes the leg bent a bit. Yeah. And so you s really feel that, that movement of trying to find his, his coin. But this, is, but this is a street scene, right? This I is mean, a he's street just scene. Something this is something he... that he would have seen, but it's the, the brilliance with which he observes humanity. The sketches also offer a glimpse into Rembrandt himself and his development as an artist. You see the artist thinking on paper. There are mistakes and he doesn't try to cover it up. It's, he's not doing it for somebody else or to sell. He does it for himself. Mm. And yeah, then you get the raw inside glimpse mm. of what he thinks, what makes him laugh, what makes him grieve, what makes him sad. One of his main subjects was himself. The exhibition opens with a room full of self-portraits done throughout his life. Smiling, frowning, young and old. He used them in part to practice techniques that would come to embody his larger works. In other cases, they served as a statement to the outside world, one that at times had its critics. They called him the first heretic in art history. Jonathan Bicker is curator of research here um, and author of the new book, Rembrandt, Biography of a Rebel. A number of them um, mentioned that he broke the rules yeah. um, um, of our art. Which meant um, what? A variety of things. Some of the things he, they accused him of doing, we wouldn't think of as radical at all. Yeah. For example, painting um, old, uh, wrinkled women. What you were supposed to do was uh, to select the best, the most beautiful things in nature and improve upon that. Rembrandt didn't do that. For Rembrandt, this was yeah, the ideal playing field for uh, light and dark. For Bicker, the culmination of Rembrandt's achievement is the painting known as The Jewish Bride, a portrait of two lovers cast as the Old Testament's Isaac and Rebecca. This is the greatest um, painted ode to love that was ever made. The greatest. The greatest. It also shows Rembrandt's technique. Here, the use of thick layers of richly colored paint. It's modeled like clay. The high point of that technique is figuratively and literally in the sleeve of Isaac. That is the thickest passage of paint in any 17th century uh, painting produced in Europe. Every painting that Rembrandt did was a different experiment. The celebration also sheds new light on Rembrandt the man, walking the streets of Amsterdam, a celebrity artist in his own day in one of the world's wealthiest cities. He lived on quite a large scale. He spent a lot of money. He was an avid collector of expensive and beautiful things. Lidave de Kukuk is the director of the Rembrandt House Museum. 
Rembrandt originally bought the house at the height of his fame, near one of Amsterdam's iconic canals. And he used it as a living space, studio, and workshop for his apprentices. Here, his first wife, Saskia. A new exhibition examines his social network, family, friends, and colleagues. We have this romantic idea about Rembrandt, you know, being very grumpy, being a lonely genius, but he was not at all. I mean, he was obsessed by art, and art was foremost in his life. So he surrounded himself with people, and that is what the exhibition shows, people that shared his interest in art, that he could discuss art with, uh, connoisseurs, pupils, uh, artist friends. Well connected, but not always easy. We, of course, think of him as a genius, yeah. but a genius with, I don't know, with a temper and uh, opinionated and not being always a very nice guy. Aletta Fleischer, an art historian, leads tours on Rembrandt in Amsterdam and took us to the Royal yeah, Palace, site of one of the lowest points of his career. As the story goes, Rembrandt was commissioned to paint a portrait of the first-century warrior Gaius Civilis. But his version, a moody and gritty depiction, was not what his benefactors were expecting. And they pulled the painting shortly after its completion. The client wanted one thing and he gave them another story. And yeah. he, he was completely sure that what he did was the right thing. Yeah. His man was more truthful, he felt. While he continued to receive commissions, his later life proved turbulent. Overspending led Rembrandt to declare bankruptcy, and he spent the remainder of his life in relative poverty. He was buried in a rental grave here at the Westerkirk. His remains eventually moved and lost to history. It was a life filled with success, happiness, great tragedy. And it's all there in the artwork, notably in the portraits of his wife Saskia. She gave birth to four children, but only one survived to adulthood and she herself died just shy of her 30th birthday. Well, Curator Jane her. Turner. Um, there are lovely portraits of her, but there are also a series of very sad um, drawings mm. when um, before or after she's lost one of her children. And this is gritty everyday life yeah. Yeah. and poignant. And you, and you can imagine him wanting to sit with her because she's sad or she's ill or whatever. And while he sits with her, he draws her. And it comes through that he loves her. He adores her. Yeah. He absolutely adores her. For Jonathan Bicker, it's uh, that ability that keeps Rembrandt is, relevant uh, and beloved three and a half centuries after his couple. death. We still have emotions in the 21st century. Yeah. It, it's what defines us, basically, as human beings. Mm -hmm. So when we look at Rembrandt's paintings, but also his etchings and his drawings, we actually experience our own humanity. The exhibition All the Rembrandts runs through June 10th. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Finally tonight, some sad news. Last month, we reported on Ariella Stein, an 11-year-old girl featured in our story about Hope for Henry. It's a program that helps hospitals support seriously ill children. Ariella lost her battle with cancer yesterday. You can see our original story about her and the Hope for Henry program on our website. We extend our condolences to Ariella's family, her friends, and her caregivers. And that is the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. We hope you have a good weekend. Thank you. You're watching PBS.